Thank you, Marsha, and thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful to be here. I have the dubious privilege of being the last speaker. I can see a lot of people have left already. But everyone can relax um, because this is going to be much more clinical than the previous presentations. Um, so what I propose to do in the next 25, 30 minutes or so is to talk about differences in epidemiology, clinical presentation, some of the medical complications, and also outcome between boys and girls with eating disorders. And really, just to say, I'm talking through the lens of an adolescent medicine physician. I'm a pediatrician with expertise in working with teenagers, primarily a clinician. So hardly a month goes by where there isn't some mention in the lay press of eating disorders. And usually these are the images you see, usually a female, usually someone who's famous. And this was a movie that some of you may have seen about a year and a half ago, where both the producer and the actress had anorexia nervosa. And in fact, the actress lost about 20 to 30 pounds in order to fulfill this role. These are the images we see that, and we equate with beauty. Thinness is beauty and success. But boys are also exposed to some of these media images, and they're a little bit different. They're not so much focused on thinness, but they're more on leanness and muscularity. Anorexia nervosa is not new. It's been around since the 1600s. It's a condition characterized by voluntary self-starvation to the point of emaciation. It occurs primarily in girls and women, but we do see it in males. Five to 10% of our patients are male. We don't hear a lot about it in males, though, but of interest is the first description of anorexia nervosa in the 1600s by Richard Morton actually described two patients, and one of those was an 18-year-old male with anorexia nervosa. It is said that anorexia nervosa or eating disorders in males are underdiagnosed, undertreated, and misunderstood. And it's probably because of our preconceptions. In 1997, Dr. Pope described something called muscle dysphoria, which is characterized by an obsessive preoccupation with muscularity. And young men often think themselves of being too small. They want to be more muscular. As a result, they exercise excessively, and also they may use anabolic steroids. And many of our patients with anorexia nervosa fall into this category rather than the trying to be too thin category. In fact, he has shown, Dr. Pope has shown that over time, some of the images of the toys that boys play with also have changed over time, becoming much more muscular in the 1990s compared to the 1980s. Interestingly enough, we've learned the most about the biology of starvation, not from studying adolescent girls and women, but rather by studying young men. And these are the famous Keyes experiments where they took 36 young men and voluntarily starved them over a period of six months to find out the effects of malnutrition and how to nutritionally rehabilitate these young men. These were healthy men. And anyone want to guess how many calories they were placed on to get to look like this? Anyone? 500? Anyone else? 800. OK. So they were placed on 8, 1,600 calories after a period of 12 weeks control. And over time, they developed a skeletal appearance. They developed many of the features I'm going to talk about, low heart rates, low blood pressure, orthostatic changes. They developed low bone dens density, bone mineral density, low sperm counts. But in addition to all of the medical complications, they also started to focus and obsess about food and weight. They hid recipes. They hid food. One became bulimic, and one became depressed and attempted suicide. So I would put it to you that anyone in this room who decided to go on self-starvation might develop all the features of an eating disorder. What do we know about the changing epidemiology of eating disorders? We know we're seeing more males. And we know that there are sex differences, but similar to the theme you've already heard, um, those differences become prevalent during the adolescent years. This over here is a paper published a month ago 
showing that the prevalence in 9 to 10-year-old children is really one-to-one, -one, male to female ratio. We always know about the 9 to 1 ratio in adolescents and young adults, but there are some wonderful studies from Australia, the United Kingdom, and Canada showing that in younger adolescents, those under the age of 13, that ratio is more like 6 to 1 rather than 9 to 1. And we also know that the prevalence of males engaging in eating disordered activities or behaviors in the community is much higher than the prevalence of those referred to clinical programs such as our own. And what is the reason there? Probably because of our preconception that eating disorders are a female disease and that boys don't develop eating disorders. What about disordered eating in sexual and gender minorities? We know that unhealthy weight control behaviors are more than four times prevalent among gay and bisexual males compared to heterosexual males. And in one study of 135 males with eating disorders, 27% reported being primarily homosexual or bisexual. And also we know that in transgender populations, um, disordered eating behaviors are very, very common. In people who are birth assigned female, often it's a desire to suppress menses. And in someone who's birth assigned male, it may be a goal to look more like the feminine ideal, such as what we showed you a little bit earlier. These are the prevalence data um, for eating disorders. This is over here you can see for anorexia nervosa, one in 200 adolescent females meet criteria for this disorder. Prevalence is much lower in males. For bulimia, it's higher, somewhere around 5% of adolescents meet criteria. And you can see the peak age of onset for anorexia nervosa is mid-adolescence, and for bulimia is somewhat later. So I've mentioned this already, one in 10 people with eating disorders are male, but actually about 25% of the oops of the eating disorder population are male. Important to realize though, although we may see more males with eating disorders being bisexual or gay, the vast majority of males are heterosexual. So we can't make any assumptions. Just to define what eating disorders are, anorexia nervosa is this condition whereby individuals restrict their energy intake to the point that they become emaciated. There's the intense fear of gaining weight or becoming overweight, and they have a distortion in the way they perceive themselves. For girls, it's they see themselves as being fatter, but for boys, it might be that they see themselves as being too small. Bulimia nervosa is a related but different condition. Here people usually are of normal weight, and the key feature actually is the binging. It's eating large amounts of food, or what they perceive to be, it actually has to be an objectively large amount of food in a short period of time, and there's a sense of lack of control during that episode. The inappropriately com compensatory behaviors, we all know about self-induced vomiting, but it could be other behaviors, such as going to the gym and working out for two to three hours after an episode of binging. Or it could be use of laxatives, diuretics, or diet pills. And these behaviors need to occur with a certain chronicity at least once a week for a period of three months. The truth is most patients coming to our programs don't meet criteria for anorexia nervosa or bulimia nervosa. This is a study published from our unit by Rebecca Peebles, almost 1,000 patients, and you can see the vast majority met criteria for EDNOS, which just means eating disorder not otherwise specified. In 2013, though, DSM revised the criteria and included some other categories. You still have anorexia nervosa, you still have bulimia nervosa, but there are two other categories that we see fairly frequently. One is ARFID, which stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, and the other is atypical anorexia nervosa. And just to state that both of these seem to be more prevalent in boys than in girls. 
But what are these conditions? So ARFID is this condition where people are often picky eaters and will only eat certain types of foods. It can be green foods or yellow foods or foods of certain consistencies. Um, but they won't mix those foods. Many of these individuals have been at the lower percentiles right throughout their life. There is a subgroup, though, that had an episode like a choking episode, and they're scared that this may happen again, so they're fearful of eating because of that. There is no body image distortion, and there is no fear of gaining weight, but they all are underweight and may have growth suppression. Compared to anorexia nervosa, offered patients, though, are more likely to be male. And some of these are on the autism spectrum disorder spectrum. The other condition is called atypical anorexia nervosa. I've just come from clinic now where we saw a new patient with this condition. And this is a condition where people, someone was previously overweight, told by their well-meaning pediatrician to watch their weight, watch what they eat, and then come back and see me in a year. And so they start, uh, usually what happens is they may actually only eat one or two things or one or two meals and start exercising excessively, and then come back some months later, and they can be profoundly bradycardic, that's having a low heart rate, or vital signs, unstable, can have unstable vital signs. And here, too, we're seeing that these are more likely to be male. Males tend to be much more concrete in their thinking. They're told to cut down on the eating, so they'll only have one meal a day, and they think that's the way that they will become healthy. Just about the medical complications, um, I'll just show you a couple of pictures. You don't need to know all of this, but the eating disorders can affect every single organ system that we have. The most common features, though, of episodes of evidence of severe malnutrition, proximal muscle wasting, intercostal wasting, loss of body fat, Electrolyte abnormalities, especially if in those who throw up or use laxatives or diuretics. The most common one being low potassium levels, that's called hypokalemia. They can have really low heart rates in the 30s or 40s. They always think that this is because they quote unquote physically unfit, but no, that's actually not true. They can have abnormalities in the EKG and the electrolytes and, and conduction defects. They can have pericardial effusions, that's fluids surrounding the heart. They can have enlargement of their parotids, problems with digestion that results in constipation. Um, they can have a whole host of other problems. The problems that affect us, though, and worry me as a clinician working with adolescents, are those that are potentially irreversible such as the impact on growth, the impact on bone mineral density acquisition, peak bone mass acquisition, as we've just heard, and then also the effects on the brain. What happens is with an eating disorder is you get regression of the whole hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. In girls, this results in amenorrhea, and all those the ovaries shrink just like a postmenopausal woman. Why is this important? You've already heard a little bit about bones, but it's important because of the relationship between the duration of amenorrhea and bone mineral density. So the longer the duration, the lower the bone mineral density. And why is that important? Because of the risk of fracture. Here are two sets of studies, one done in Boston, a group of adults with anorexia nervosa, and over here by our group, this was in New York, of adolescents with anorexia nervosa. And just to orient you, this over here is looking at T-scores. That's in adults. A T-score is the number of standard deviations below the young adult mean. And you can see that 90% of patients with anorexia nervosa had a T-score lower than minus 1. And about 40% had a T-score lower than minus 2.5. With teenagers, we don't use T-scores, we use Z-scores, which is compared to age-matched means. So here, too, you can see that about 30% of our patients presented with low bone mineral density. And these are young teenagers 
and their bone mineral density was more than two standard deviations below the age match norm. It's not just restricted to girls with anorexia nervosa. Here again from Boston, at every site measured, boys too had lower bone mineral density than healthy controls. And the patients with anorexia nervosa are shown here in the solid columns. Well, what about the differences? So this is a study done by our group at Stanford by someone who's a pediatric resident. He was the lead author, but Dr. Leonard was also involved in this using that same database, and they studied close to 10,000 females with anorexia nervosa and 556 males with anorexia nervosa, and compared them to 92,000 females and 5,560 males who were age match controls. This is that same database from the United Kingdom. And what they showed is that for females, at every decade of life, there was an increased risk of fracture. However, for males, there was only an increased risk of fracture at the age of 40 plus. And we're not really sure why, but I think you've heard from Dr. Leonard, is that healthy adolescent males have a higher risk of fracture, and that might be related to some of the behaviors. I saw someone in the back there with a skateboard, um, so I was just thinking of that. Anyway. But what do we know about medical findings in males with eating disorders? We don't know a lot. One study, and I was involved with this paper a long time ago, showed that when males present for, to a clinical center, they really present late in their onset and they often require to be hospitalized. A more recent study over here of 33 males, this is from UCSF and Dr. Vose, one of our faculty, showed that 50% of patients on presentation met criteria for hospitalization because of medical instability. And here's another study that showed that high numbers of them have medical instability based on low heart rates and also orthostatic hypotension. That means their blood pressure drops from lying to standing. But what about sex differences? We don't know a lot. There's only one study, actually, that compared findings in males to those in females. And the truth is, there wasn't any difference, that the medical findings are much the same. And the only documented difference so far is the one that I described to you, Dr. Nagata's study that Dr. Leonard was involved in, showing the increased risk of fractures at every decade of life in females with eating disorders. The medical management involves a multidisciplinary approach, medical doctors, psychologists, and dietitians, as well as others. And the medical management is really to stabilize the patient, to try and restore weight if weight is low, and to try and treat some of the medical complications. Most patients are treated as outpatients. Okay, I just flipped over the indications for medical hospitalization because most patients are treated as outpatients. And the truth is that the treatment is the same. We don't know anything about how to treat males differently from females, other than the fact is that there have been some, some people have felt that males who are in a partial program might do better with other males, but that's not really known. That hasn't been studied. Um, at the moment, we have 12 patients on our unit, Two of those are male. Um, but sometimes there may only be one male on the unit. And that might be problematic because that person may not be able to identify with some of the thoughts and feelings of the other patients. What we now use is something called family-based treatment where we empower the parents to refeed their children. Um, it's really focused on the family, the parents, more than the old model, which was focused on the individual. And there are a number of assumptions. The parents are not to blame. In fact, they are part of the treatment. Um, and they are mobilized to try and take care of their child and refeed their child. There are three phases. The first phase is to restore the weight. The second phase is give back autonomy to the adolescent. And the third phase is to deal with some of the adolescent issues that led to the development of the eating disorder. 
The treatment, like I said, is essentially the same. We don't know of different approaches to treat boys differently from girls, but I would imagine that some of the issues in the third phase of family-based treatment might be different in the psychological treatment. What about the outcome? Well, this is a retrospective study of over 1,000 patients with anorexia nervosa from, from a single center in Denmark, which is the center for the whole country for treating eating disorders. You can see about a third had anorexia nervosa, about a third had bulimia, and a third had what was called EDNOS from DSM-4. And you can see, in general, males tend to do better. Here you can see median time to remission was short in males, three years versus seven years. And among those who were severely ill, also males tended to be, do better with about 59% achieving recovery as opposed to 39% of females. Now these are adults primarily, not children and adolescents. Um, our data for children and adolescents in general are much better than for adults but we don't know about sex differences in outcome. So we should also know that the mortality of these illnesses is still pretty high. It's somewhere between 5 and 10%, and we don't know about sex differences in mortality, um, but I can tell you that both boys and girls um, can die, and it's usually because of electrolyte disturbances, either from malnutrition or during refeeding, or it can be from suicidal ideation and su completed suicide. So my take home message is, is be aware of the possibility of an underlying eating disorder. If you're working with young boys or young adolescents, it, it occurs in boys and adolescents, and, and it occurs in males, children, and adolescents. Um, disordered eating, body dissatisfaction, and exercise among females is really focused on the thin ideal. But in boys, it's more about muscularity and being big and lean. And the perception that eating disorders don't occur in males is actually has done a disservice to all of us. Because remember, the first two patients ever described, one was a male. But then we never heard about males for centuries. Um, literally, always perceived to be a female disease. But for that reason, we don't have a lot of research, and we don't know a lot about differences in outcome and also treatment strategies. And one final point with regard to this is if you look at actually the DSM-4 criteria, one of the criteria was amenorrhea. Again, focused on females, not on boys. You know, boys don't have amenorrhea. Um, and the questionnaires that are currently used really focus, they don't focus on muscularity, they focus on thinness and their desire for thinness. So we're very prejudiced in the way we look at things and assess things.